Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Today we are going to continue our exploration of cheese making. Uh, and cheese making is something that I'm just sort of exploring at this point. So, so far on the channel we made uh, ricotta, we made cottage cheese and squeaky cheese curds. Um, and they all turned out really well. And they're all fairly simple recipes for cheese that you can do at home. Today we're going to make cream cheese, um, which again, seems to be a fairly simple process. So I've got a heavy cast iron pot here, a Dutch oven, on sort of medium low heat because I want to heat up all of the milk to about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And <laughs> this milk has a plug on the top. So this is non-homogenized and it is 4.8% milk fat. Um, it's pasteurized, but not homogenized. And there is that cream plug at the top. Absolutely amazing. Uh, let me get a knife and see if I can get that out. Okay, let's try the end of a spoon. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Look at that cream on the top. Absolutely incredible. Okay, so this is the last of the milk. Now, about the milk. I have got the highest fat milk um, that I could find easily. I'm pretty sure that I could have gotten a little bit more fat in the milk if I'd looked harder. So we still need to add a little bit of fat, and I'm going to do that with this whipping cream. So just a little bit of whipping cream. And this should give us all the fat that we need um, in order to get a really nice creamy cream cheese. So I got, um, this was non-homogenized, but it was pasteurized, but not ultra high temperature pasteurized. So there's, there's a couple of different ways of pasteurizing milk um, that are in use in North America. And one is sort of the traditional pasteurization temperature, which is somewhere around 160 to 161 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and at that temperature, it renders the milk safe. Uh, but it also screws up the milk proteins a little bit, not too much, but still screws them up a little bit, which isn't very noticeable for most applications. Now you get into um, ultra high temperature pasteurized milk where they heat it up even further and it completely screws up the protein structure of the milk. And if you're just putting milk in your coffee or on your cereal or I don't know, um, just sort of general use around your house, you're never going to notice. But for this process, you don't want to get ultra high temperature pasteurized milk because the proteins will be too screw screwed up when you go to do this process. Um, so take a look at the milk carton and try to get milk that isn't ultra high temperature pasteurized. Uh, and the reason they do this ultra high temperature pasteurization is so that the, the milk lasts longer at the supermarket. It doesn't spoil as quickly. Um, and I got to tell you, 90% of the time you're not going to notice. The cream, however, you're probably in North America, again, generally speaking, always exceptions to this, you're probably only going to be able to get ultra high temperature pasteurized cream. And you'll notice on all of the cartons for the UHT pasteurized cream that they've had to add stuff into it um, because you've screwed up the proteins and it doesn't react the way that it's supposed to. So they add stuff like carrageenan and uh, cellulose gum in order to thicken it up so that it reacts the way that it's supposed to. And we're not looking for any proteins out of this cream, we're just looking for the fat, so that doesn't matter so much. Um, there is one brand that's available to me here um, where I live that is just regular pasteurized, um, but it's like four times the price and I didn't want to go that route. Okay, let's check the temperature. We're trying to get to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's give it a little bit of a swirl. We shouldn't be very close. Now we're still around seven. So we've still got a little ways to go. Now, this is an induction cooktop and I've got fairly precise control over how quickly it heats and the temperature that it reaches. If I was doing this inside on the gas stove or with a, one of the round coil stoves, I would probably use a bain -marie, um, just so that I didn't overshoot the temperature too far. You don't really want to go too far beyond 86 and you sort of want it at 86 to 84 or 84 degrees Fahrenheit to 86 so that you don't kill the culture that we're going to put in. And this is a lactobacillus culture and the lactobacillus culture is going to give us a tangy flavor, um, sort of develop a nice deep rich flavor to the cheese. 
rather than just having the fat flavor. So as this warms up, one of the other things that we need to add is calcium chloride. And calcium chloride is, uh, is put in, and there's not very much, quarter teaspoon. And we put that in to sort of overcome the, well, not sort of, to overcome the problems that you have from using pasteurized milk. Remember I said that the, the proteins are screwed up a little bit? This will help it to coagulate and, and um, reach that curd stage that you really need when we add the rennet in. So let's just wait for this to heat up and then we'll move on to the next step. Let's check the temperature, see where we're at. 87, it blew past by one degree. So I'm just gonna stir it a little bit. One degree is not too bad. As I move this around, it sort of fluctuates between 86 and 87, so I think we're okay. Now, we're gonna add in this uh, lactobacillus culture. And this culture in particular is one that, it's the same mix of lactobacillus bacteria that is used to make buttermilk. Uh, if you live in North America, the buttermilk you're buying at the store is cultured. It's not actually what's left over from the process of making butter. Um, originally it would have been, but sometime around World War I, they just stopped doing that. And so, of course, there's exceptions. And I'm sure that somebody's going to know the exception of where you can buy real buttermilk. But if you're buying buttermilk in the store, it is usually skim milk, 1%, that has this culture put in it, and this culture thickens it up a little bit and causes that tangy, acidic flavor um, that you would have gotten from the actual liquid left over from butter making. It's complicated. Um, it really is. Shouldn't be, but it is. So I've got the culture, and I just sprinkle it over top. I don't want to stir it in yet. I want it to soften in the milk, so I'm going to leave it for about five minutes before I stir it in. That will apparently keep it from clumping, allowing you to get a good mix throughout the liquid. And next in is rennet, and this is animal rennet. Now the rennet is what sets the proteins and causes everything to coagulate together or thicken. Uh, and for this amount of milk, it's somewhere between four and six drops. So, one, two, three, four. And let's do five, just for good measure. Now, we'll stir to combine this all together. Now, you want to give this a really good stir. Make sure it's all mixed together. Make sure that the culture and the rennet are everywhere in the milk. And I've read a whole bunch of different things about stirring technique. Um, there is stirring technique in every kitchen operation. And usually, you stir around in a whirlpool. Uh, for this, I've been told a kind of an up and down motion is what you're looking for uh, everywhere in the pot. Now, that's it for today. That's it for today. I'm going to put the lid on this. I'm going to keep it in the kitchen warm. Um, I'm going to keep the kitchen at a temperature that's a little bit higher than normal, probably around 74 degrees Fahrenheit. And this will sit at room temperature, 74, 75 for the next 12 to 24 hours. Um, you won't do anything to it, and it's okay that it's gonna drop from that 86 down to about 74 or 75, that's fine. We'll come back tomorrow and we'll look at it and I'll tell you the signs that you're looking for before we move on to the next step. Okay, about 16 hours have gone by. And I think it's time to move on to the next step. And there's a couple ways that you can tell. One is just by smell, um, it has a very, sort of bright um, acidic smell and you can tell that the bacteria have done their job. The second way is that you'll notice if you tip it or you look really closely, there's a layer of liquid whey on top. It has started to weep and it's also started to pull away from the sides of the pan. That lets you know that the curd is set and the whey is starting to drain. And draining all of that whey is the next step. And so I've got a colander here set inside a bowl to catch the whey. And I've also got some cheesecloth. And this is a really good quality cheesecloth. Uh, a lot of people might call it a butter muslin. It has a very tight, fine weave. Uh, the stuff that you get at the grocery store or at the hardware store, um, the weave is probably too loose to actually do what you want it to do. Now you just take a slotted spoon and you sort of very carefully grab the curd and move it over. And I suppose you could pour it out, but 
Uh, everything I've read says to very carefully sort of move it over. I'll probably have to pour it at the end. And now we just let this drain for about two hours and the level of your whey reaches the bottom of the colander, of course, pour it off. So my understanding is whey in this instance can't be used to make ricotta. Um, it's too acidic apparently. So I'm not gonna try and do that, but I am gonna take a little spoonful of this and give it a taste. Let's see how we're doing here. Hmm. That's quite nice. Um, so a little bit of an acidic tang, not too acidic. Um, not overly funky on the flavor. And my understanding is that that flavor will continue to develop um, as it drains and as it hangs in the next step, because we're still probably 24 hours away from this being cream cheese. Two hours have gone by and a lot of whey has drained out of this cheese. So at this point, I just need to gather up the four corners and we're going to hang this for another 12 to 20 hours. Uh, and two or three times during that 12 to 20 hours, I'm gonna take it down, open it up, and give it a stir. And during the last stir, I'm gonna add a little bit of salt, and that's going to both flavor the cheese and help release that last bit of whey. Now I just need to figure out how to hang this up here. Let's see what I can do. Okay, so C-stands aren't really kitchen equipment, uh, but they are so very handy. I'll see you in another 12 to 24 hours. Hey, Jules. Hey, hey, we finally get to have some of this. I feel like I've been staring at this on the counter or literally hanging around <laughs> for a few days. So this is day I didn't three. Count. Day three, okay. It's day just, three or day, day three? I just got the don't touch this um, <laughs> message when so, I showed up in the counter. So very time consuming. Well, and not, not time it consuming. It just takes time. It just takes time. You just have to wait for it to happen. Um, technically not very difficult. Okay. Um, it's got a nice, that tart, creamy. It's got it. Mm, yeah. I'm just going to eat it straight up just to see. I think I could put a little more salt in at the end. Um, so that that end part where it was hanging, I, you stir it a few times and you let it drain. The longer you let it drain, the stiffer it becomes. Okay. So I've, this one is still pretty spreadable. It's got a lovely texture though. Like it has a Lovely, Lovely creamy texture. Creamy texture. Um, it's got that tang from yeah. the, which is nice. Probably would have put in a little bit more salt, but that's something that you have to play with as you, I mean, it's the first time I've ever and made it. And I suspect it. if you really wanted more salt, you could just... Just put a little bit on. <laughs> but I think that's really good cream cheese. It is really good cream cheese. It's a lot of cream cheese, though. I don't know that we're going to, unless we make something with it, so, I don't know yeah. we're going to use that fast enough. So that's a kilo. I got a kilo of cream cheese. Out of what we started with, we ended up with a kilo of cream cheese. A lot of cream cheese. Um, Very big cake. Maybe. You could make it with less, but it would still take the same amount of time. Is it worth it? From the standpoint of learning how it's made and being an all-star after the zombie apocalypse because you know how to <laughs> make cream cheese, <laughs> yes, I think, it's worth it. I think it's worth it to understand where your food comes from. But am I going to whip this up next time I want to make a cheesecake or just have it in the... And it might be something you make and share amongst a group of you, uh, right? Special occasions, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a worthwhile project, but I don't know that it's something that I will do on a regular basis. But it is really good. So I think we'll make a cheesecake or something with it. I'm going to look up a bunch of, ch bunch of recipes that use cream cheese and look out for those over the next little while. Was cream cheese really common in the 30s? I, Was it even a staple? I'm going to take a look. I have uh, no idea. Uh, things to learn. Yeah. So, um, give cream cheese a try if you are on, uh, if you're exploring food. Uh, thanks and you've got three days. And you've got three <laughs> days. And you don't need a whole lot of tools. It doesn't take a lot of tools or knowledge. Patience. Patience. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.